Imagine it's spring 2020, you're in lockdown in peak COVID, and you unexpectedly find yourself getting divorced. This is what happened to Lexi Monte. We didn't have much information at that time, so I was holed up alone in my small New York City apartment, completely alone, devastated, and afraid. Everyone I knew had fled the city, which was then the epicenter of the pandemic, and my family is thousands of miles apart. I was fighting battles at work in the face of global shortages and supply chain disruptions and everything else that was going on at that time. My first night, home alone without my husband, the street corner directly below my window was on fire and there were helicopters. I live right off the main protest route, and so between election chaos and social justice movements, the helicopters stayed for five straight days and nights. The incessant 24-hour noise was a special kind of torture. It was so loud, I couldn't sleep. I became a shell of a person, basically dead on the floor. As Lexi experienced her own despair, there was also the collective heaviness we faced as New Yorkers. Medical tents sprouted in Central Park, and hospitals with refrigerated 16-wheelers parked outside, full of dead bodies. I, too, was holed up alone in my apartment. I had caught COVID. It was so severe, I had 911 on speed dial, and didn't know what would happen next. I remember rereading a wonderful book, uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, and realized that what I was missing the most was meaningful connection. Then one day, Christian sent me an email. We met 13 years ago, but we didn't know each other that well. We kept in touch here and there, but I hadn't seen him in four years. The email was an invitation to an outdoor gathering in New York City, where he had just moved. After being isolated for months, and when the numbers finally came down a bit, I sent an email to a few people that I wanted to see, asking them if they wanted to meet outdoors safely. I sent it to a couple of close friends, but given that I was new in town, also to people I hadn't seen for a long time, like Lexi. After my failure at marriage, I was embarrassed and I really didn't want to see anybody, so I ignored his email. <laughs> But a few days later, he posted a quote on Instagram about how the most beautiful people are those who have known defeat, suffering, struggle, and loss. I direct messaged him to share how much that really moved me, and he responded with a reminder about tomorrow's gathering. I hadn't planned on going, but coincidentally, I had just signed my divorce agreement the day before, far sooner than expected. And so I thought, Reconnecting with an old friend, perhaps making some new ones, would be a good start to my new life. So I decided to go. I ended up having a great time dancing and singing until late, and I felt this return to myself. I even met a guy there and went on a date with him. A week later, Christian and I had plans for dinner, and I was so excited to tell him I went out with the guy from the rooftop. And that morning, I went on a long walk on the Hudson River, and I reflected on what I even want in a relationship. Not the type of person, but the qualities of the relationship itself. I typed them into my phone, and later over dinner, I mentioned the list. I was intrigued and wanted to learn more. Actually, Lexi was hesitant to share the list with me, but after some negotiation, uh, she agreed to, hesitatingly so, not show me the list, but to read it to me. I was flabbergasted. Lexi's list was exactly what I was looking for in a relationship. Some things like passion and romance or laughter and humor were pretty ubiquitous, but other things, more unexpectedly, were love that inspires you to do great things or being co-founders in life that exactly aligned with what I wanted in a relationship. I felt ready for a true relationship but hadn't found the right person, and Lexi's list lit a spark in me. At every bullet point in my head, I went tick, 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 Check, check. The unfolding conversation in that evening opened up the possibility that there might be more than just a friendship. In fact, we were looking for the same thing. As the evening and night went on, an accidental grace of our hands triggered butterflies. Two years later, Lexi is my wife, and... <laughs> and, and we have a wonderful baby girl who's with us here today. Um, today, with, uh, today with less, less blueberries in her face. What was the worst thing that had ever happened to me turned out to be the very best. What Christian and I encountered, this very unexpected love, was like life in general. It's not a linear path. It's a squiggly line with unexpected twists and turns. 
we tend to see unexpected experiences that interrupt our plans as a threat. I certainly did. But when you look back and connect the dots in hindsight, the unexpected often plays a big role in the most meaningful happenings in our lives. It can bring you unexpected positive outcomes that give you joy, success, and meaning called serendipity. As a professor at New York University and the London School of Economics, for the last 10 years I've studied what makes some people and organizations more successful than others, and we studied over 200 of the world's most successful CEOs, leaders, and organizations, and what they tend to have in common is that they cultivate serendipity by identifying and leveraging the value in the unexpected. So over the last 10 years, we developed a science-based framework for cultivating serendipity. I'll spare you the uh, nerdy details of our research papers and my book, but let's look at a couple of examples of serendipity to make sure that we're on the same page. Here on the uh, you know, upper left, the quintessential coffee shop example, uh, if you have erratic hand movements like I do, you spill a lot of coffee. And so imagine you're in a coffee shop, and you spill coffee accidentally over someone. And they look at you annoyedly, but you sense there might be something there. You don't know what it is, you just sense there might be something there. Now you have a couple of options, right? One option is you just say, I'm sorry, you walk outside, and you think, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with that person? Another option is you start that conversation, that person turns out to be the love of your life, your co-founder, or you know, your next hiking buddy. The point is your reaction to the unexpected. You making the accident meaningful is what turns the accident into serendipity. Any ideas what this might be on the upper right? Any ideas? Uh... Yes, well done. <laughs> I just wanted to say it's usually a good sign if you don't know it, but now I can't say this anymore. <laughs> But so, a couple of decades ago, some researchers were giving people medication against angina pectoris, the heart pain, and they realized some unexpected movement in male participants' trousers. <laughs> so, what would we usually do? We would probably say, oh my god, that's embarrassing. Or we would try to, you know, ignore that kind of side effect. Those researchers did the opposite. They said, you know what, that's unexpected, but there's probably a lot of men in the world who might have a problem in that department. So why don't we develop a medication around this? And that is how serendipitously so Viagra, here under the generic name Sildenafil, became a, a best-selling product. Any ideas what this might be here on the lower left? Yeah, yeah, chicken fryer, deep fryer, any, any other bits? Washing machine? That's extremely close. So it's a mixture, actually, between all of those. And so a couple of, um, couple of years ago, a company in China, they produce washing machines, refrigerators, one of the largest white goods producers in the world. They received calls from farmers. And the farmers told them, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. Well, why is it breaking down? Well, we're trying to wash our potatoes, and it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> so what would we usually do? We'll probably try to educate the customer, right, and tell them, don't wash your potatoes in the washing machine. It's for clothes. It's not made for potatoes. They did the opposite. They said, you know what? There's probably a lot of farmers in the world who might have a similar problem. So why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? And that's how the potato washing machine became one of their products. And then last, but of course, absolutely not least, the recent Pfizer uh, COVID vaccine a company in Germany called BioNTech, a wife-husband uh, co-founding duo. They set up a company called BioNTech. They uh, fo first focused on mRNA technologies to tackle cancer, but then they realized, oh wow, we can actually use this to uh, tackle COVID. And when COVID happened, they uh, developed the first US authorized COVID vaccine that they, in partnership with Pfizer, um, developed into best-selling product. Now, what these examples, and you know, as you know, there's, there's millions and millions other examples of serendipity. Some studies suggest that up to 50% of inventions and innovations tend to be serendipitous. And from those that we studied, from the hundred and hundred of examples, it's fascinating that it's usually not just an event. It's not just something that happens to us. It is always the same process. And that process is that there's some kind of trigger happening, some kind of serendipity trigger, right? So there's this unexpected event, like unexpected movement in male participants' trousers, or spilling that coffee, or farmers calling up and saying, your crappy washing machine's breaking down. But then we have to do something with it. We have to connect the dots. We have to imbue meaning in the accident, and then also have the tenacity to actually go through with it. 
It's not enough to just, you know, realize the movement. We have to ask why, how, and then develop the medication. And so it's that tenacity that actually turns it into actual serendipitous outcomes. The beautiful thing is once you see serendipity, not as an event, but as a process, you see that you can actually influence it. You can help to spot more of those potential serendipity triggers, or you can even create some of those. You can help to connect the dots better, and you can develop the tenacity to actually go through with it. That's very different from blind luck, right? Blind luck is what just happens to us. It's being born into a nice family, stuff like that. Serendipity is about smart luck. It's the smart luck we create by our own actions by making accidents meaningful or creating more meaningful accidents. So how do we study this? My team and I use a lot of qualitative methodology where you go into a particular setting and you try to understand how do unexpected events evolve and emerge and what do people do with it, and then you can differentiate who does something with it versus not, or experiments where you put people into exactly the same situation where they encounter an unexpected event and then you see how they react differently to it. And so in this work, what has fascinated me is that there's evidence-based cultivating serendipity strategies that we can all use. And, you know, it's even simple things like when you ask someone what surprised you last week, they start to look out more for the positively unexpected. Lexi, in her life and in her work as vice president at a leading technology company, has been an intuitive dot connector for a long time. And, you know, I've studied a lot of them, and I'm still in awe when I see her in action and how she kind of goes out there and connects the dots. And so she will share with us two two strategies of how we can cultivate serendipity. In business, unexpected circumstances can literally make or break you. And so in my experience as a marketing and communications executive, cultivating serendipity plays a huge role in my life. And perhaps one of the easiest ways that I've found is to cast hooks. Casting hooks is throwing something meaningful out there that others can grab onto and connect with. Someone who does this really well is startup Britain founder, Ollie Barrett. When he's asked that dreaded question, what do you do? He doesn't just say, I do business, or I work in various sectors. He says something along the lines of, I enjoy connecting people, I set up an education company, I recently started reading about philosophy, and I enjoy playing the piano. He gives four hooks so others can decide which relates most to them and cultivates much more serendipity than stopping at just one. Another uh, strategy for cultivating serendipity, and perhaps my favorite, is using mistakes or failures as inflection points. So often, when things don't go according to plan, the tendency is to hide it, because nobody wants to be a loser or a failure, but it's such a pity to sort of give in to our shame, because learning and potential serendipity happens most when you share what didn't work. A great example of this in business is the Project Funeral. The Project Funeral is about laying ideas to rest and reflecting on them as a group. Researchers from Harvard and the London School of Economics identified a great instance of this in a multinational health, nutrition, and materials company. There was this manager, he had a project having to do with glass that doesn't reflect light back off of it, and something didn't work out, and instead of hiding that his project fizzled out, he laid it to rest in front of a bunch of other project managers from across the company when he shared that one of his biggest hardships was that the market for this technology was just too small. Someone in the audience raised their hand and said, oh my god, have you considered solar energy as a market? Imagine how much energy could be absorbed with your technology. And that is how part of the solar division emerged at that company. The idea of leaning into these things that don't work out isn't about celebrating failure. It's about being open to the hidden learnings in what doesn't work. And it's about doing it with a group so that you can connect the dots all together or so that others can connect the dots for you. And it's a great way to build trust and to cultivate serendipity. But cultivating serendipity isn't about sort of manifesting what you want, like money or success or love, to fall from the sky and plop into your lap. And it's not about being positive all the time. For any of you who know me, I for sure am not always or maybe ever positive when things don't go according to plan or when something bad happens. And of course, bad things happen to people all the time. And nobody is to blame for plain bad luck. Plus, there's a lot of societal inequality that really constrains how much serendipity we can have. 
you can't control if you were born into poverty or homelessness or geopolitical or humanitarian tragedy or contract a really difficult illness. But we're not talking about those things that you can't control. We're talking about really identifying and embracing the potential value in the unexpected. And we're talking about cultivating serendipity. And there's a lot of hope for closet introverts like myself that serendipity a lot of times comes from calm, from quiet sources. It comes from reading a book and thinking, oh my God, here's an idea that could be a movie. Or it comes from taking another route to work and thinking, oh my God, that book in this window here could be a podcast. And so there's a lot of hope for all of us, even if we're not um, extrovert and, and uh, we can cultivate serendipity in our lives. And the question then is, of course, where does it leave us, right? And, and imagine a world in which the unexpected is not just a source of despair, of interrupting our well-laid plans, of anxiety, but actually of joy, of meaning, of potential opportunity. Maybe that's a world in which we create schools and universities and companies that create spaces for serendipity. Maybe that's a world in which we allow children to develop a muscle for the unexpected rather than pushing them into always having the perfect plan. Poet and philosopher um, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe beautifully said that if you take someone as they are, you make them worse. But if you take them as what they could be, you make them capable of becoming what they can be. The unexpected is all about potentiality. Once we see more in unexpected situations, we allow ourselves and others to become who we're truly capable of becoming. Thank you. <laughs>